is going on this week, uh, <clears throat> you know, about Broadway reopening and so forth. Uh, what I do know is uh, things are going to be staggering. Uh, I have a detailed list of what and when. Uh, but what I'm also finding out is they sort of put the cart before the horse and no one's really able to sell tickets because the box offices are all closed. So, um, you know, I'm looking at different things that maybe we can uh, get groups to go see uh, in the fall. Uh, and now we know that the mask um, mandate isn't required. That's sure going to make it a lot more interesting uh, and accessible to go. Uh, but I'm looking at booking a group to see the musical Six. I'm looking at some of the new things flying over Sunset, of course, Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh, and we're going to look and see, uh, you know, what we can schedule. I've also requested company. Uh, for those of you who were supposed to go with me last spring, I'm hoping that we can do that in January. Uh, but I'll be publishing all of the news for all of this um, as I get it. And uh, I look forward to having you all join me uh, to do that uh, as soon as we can. Well, for the next few weeks, uh, we're going to talk about the great choreographers. And uh, choreography evolved. And uh, it goes back to the era in the 1930s when George Balanchine, uh, really uh, the Russian dancer who became part of the uh, ABT, uh, became a little bit more commercial. Richard Rogers wanted to write ballet sequences. And in the musical On Your Toes, uh, they wrote the very first ballet sequence uh, for a musical. It wasn't just a tap dance and it wasn't just limited choreography uh, that went with musical numbers. This was a full-fledged ballet. Um, and it, 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 it's called The Slaughter on 10th Avenue. Um, it was filmed uh, in 1938 or so with Eddie Albert, which you're uh, going to see in a moment or two, but it was also refilmed with... This is a little clear about the battle. Slaughter on 10th Avenue was originally conceived as the finale of the Broadway musical on your toes, but it got a life of its own as a standalone piece in the 60s. When George Balanchine of the New York City Ballet decided to create it, revive it actually, for Suzanne Farrell as a striptease girl and Arthur Mitchell as the hoofer, and started presenting it as a standalone piece. It is the first full length ballet within a full length musical, so it's a story within a story. It's more jazzy, there's a plot line, the music is a lot of fun. It's an exciting ballet for a lot of reasons. First of all, like the set is special, like the costume are uh, from another time. And it's not ballet, it's really like, um, it's more like a musical. The role I'm gonna perform in Slaughter in 10th Avenue is the Hofer, he's the main guy, the main character. And this role was, is a little bit special. Um, well, for me, because I danced it a, a long time ago and it was one of my first roles. So it, it definitely is special in that way, and also because um, uh, you have to tap, and uh, I never tapped before in my life. So the rhythm is a one, two, three, four, a five, six, a seven, and an eight. I'm teaching the gentlemen how to tap dance, and I'm telling the ladies to be sexy, striptease, burlesque dancers. The men have been working on their tap skills, which just gets them deeper into their, their knee bends and their plie, as opposed to being elevated and held like ballet dancers are a little grittier and rougher and more bent over, so it's a different posture. And for the ladies, you know, it's more exhibitionist. You're, you're, you're dancing outward, and the hair is flying, and the limbs are loose, and I think the dancers, in particular, are having a really good time with this, because it is different. The music is uh, lively and it's really exciting to, because not only for the audience to hear that music and see the, the drama on stage, that's pretty cool, I think. And it's very different from what people usually see at ballet. So this mainstream choreographed finale of a musical has now been considered a, a major ballet piece. This is the original ballet from the movie, uh, seen with Eddie Albert and Zulamini.
you want. You know those two men in the box there? No. Well, I do. They're a couple of professional killers. Gangsters? Yeah, Russian version. What do you suppose they're doing at the ballet? Maybe they're going in for art.
You gave Journey the name of Markov because you knew that those killers were looking for Markov. How was I supposed to know that? All Russians know that Markov is either dead or will be killed. Come on, talk to me now. They are here to kill Junior when he's supposed to kill himself at the end of the ballet. Yes? 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 Quick, Riley, call the police. until they are arrested. Now, what we lose track of is that Richard Rogers wrote many, many ballet sequences. I mean, they're all uh, done with classical ballet style. But, you know, Gene Kelly uh, reinvented it uh, for the movie Words and Music. And uh, it was sort of a biography of uh, Larry Hart, uh, not very accurate. But they put a lot of his uh, things. And this was Balanchine reinterpreted. Uh, by Gene Kelly with Vera Ellen. I wanted to show you both because both were landmarks. And the fact that Slaughter on 10th Avenue was achieving the kind of acclaim uh, that it was uh, really uh, predicated the fact that it was in, uh, shown again in this movie. Uh, it's a, it also leads Kelly to the ballet sequence he creates in Singing in the Rain uh, seven or eight years later. But uh, I thought this was worth seeing as well. Not trying to be monotonous, uh, but trying to give you a different perspective. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Again, a slightly different feel, but again, inspired by this choreography of Balanchine and uh, Gene Kelly's reinterpretation. But again, these are just classic uh, evolutions uh, in the, uh, the the use of choreography and dance. You know, as we go through this, we talk about DeMille and Fosse and Robbins and Tommy Toon over the next few weeks. I mean, you're going to see how dance has really evolved. And of course, Gower Champion. Agnes DeMille uh, had her own musicals. Uh, she too was part of the ballet scene. And you know, when Rodgers and Hammerstein created Oklahoma, they knew they wanted to do something very different with dance. The Out of My Dreams Ballet Ladies in Oklahoma. Miss Agnes. 
this is Agnes DeMille with Sylvia Fine K talking about her creation uh, of the Out of My Dreams Ballet and walking us through how she created it. DeMille. There's something I've always wanted very much to know. Who thought of putting the ballet, the, that kind of ballet, into Oklahoma? Me, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Why was the dancing so important to Oklahoma and really to the whole American theater after that? Well, it was new. It was new because it had a lot of emotional impact and content and because all the people in the dances were people and they were characters in the play they kept their characters right through the play and all their gestures and all their style belonged to that play and couldn't possibly be used in any other musical not possibly and the the for instance the the lead curly and laurie the two leads have dancing counterparts. There's a dancing Laurie and a dancing Curly, and they're interchangeable. And we could continue the plot during the dances and during the ballets. Let me tell you about the plot. You know, the plot of Oklahoma yes. is simply, well, a girl has to make up her mind whether she'll take this boy or that boy to a picnic. This is a situation that has been faced before. True. <laughs> uh, but in this case, in this case, she was very deeply in love with one boy and terrified of the other. Well, if she was frightened of him, why didn't she send him packing? Because there was a strange, dark hold over her. I think he rather attracted her in a sinister so. way. Yes. But she makes up her mind in the ballet. Right. During the ballet, she makes up her mind. And at the end of the ballet, she has decided to go with him. Mm. And so the second act is totally different and rather more somber and serious than it would other highways have been. Now tell me something. Why do you think Oklahoma was such a great success? It was good. Oh, that was. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that Why it was such a success? The time it was yes, done. Yes, yes. It was done during the war. And New York was the biggest staging area in the whole United States. And everybody who came to that show, all the soldiers, went overseas for the duration. And I remember so well at the St. James Theater, that triple row of uniforms at the back. The men standing there watching this folksy show, happy, light, with the tears streaming down their cheeks because it symbolized home and what they were going to die for. And then after the war, when the war was over, we took it to London. London had been missed woefully hurt. It was terribly damaged. And the beautiful Drury Lane Theater had been torn up. The roof had been torn open. But they mended it, and they put it back. And they asked Oklahoma to come. And all the audience dressed up in gala and went there for the first time they were dressed since London went into the war in 39 and the blitzes started and they encored every single song and at the end they all stood joined hands and sang the whole score with the cast standing singing on stage it will never never be forgotten well they tore the rope off the theater again <laughs> One of the stars of that golden evening was the dancer, Jamsie DeLapp. She's with us tonight, and she and Blaine Savage will dance the dream ballet for us. She was the best then, she is the best now, because Jamsie brought to the commercial theater tenderness and passion.
Peter Dennison, who start this sequence, with Laurie's friends running out in the prairie to shout the happy tidings of her wedding. And you see the little fluttering, the quivering, pulsating movements that became quite famous. They're not just flat hands patting the ground, patting the earth. They're hearts beating. They're Laurie's heart. They're bird wings. They're Laurie's throat thrust beating into the morning. in the church waits the sinister hired hand, Judd Fry. <laughs> Laurie loves Curly, as we've seen. That's but obvious. she's terrified of Judd, and she thinks a great deal about him. Judd is a very brutal and sinister figure, and he's crude and gross and filthy. And he has the real... <laughs> Walls of his bedroom plastered with dirty pictures, pictures which Laurie's seen, and they shock her. But they also rather fascinate her. She's somewhat curious. Now, how does a nice girl, a good girl, imagine bad girls? Maybe. Well, well <laughs> you know, wicked, glamorous, bedizened, with bare bosoms and high skirts. Oh, shocking, wicked. How, how absolutely forbidden, how welcome. to death, that Judd in his jealous rage will murder her.
again, Richard Rogers writing, you know, these ballet sequences, but Agnes DeMille now starting a trend with classical ballet, uh, almost as a requirement in every musical that's going to succeed uh, as they go forward. And, you know, this is a very major uh, situation uh, because now the, 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 the composers of Broadway musicals have to make sure uh, that they're doing the things that uh, uh, the audiences are looking for. Now, Carousel was the second major ballet sequence that Agnes DeMille created. Uh, this is in the second act of Carousel. And if you were with me for the Rodgers and Hammerstein series, I know you may have seen this a few weeks ago, but it's worth seeing again to understand what Agnes DeMille created. Billy Bigelow goes to heaven, and he's given the opportunity to look down to see what he's left behind. And what he's left behind is really a mess. His daughter shunned by the community in which she lives, and she even being attracted in the same way to a car, to a uh to not such a great guy as her mother was and uh this is how uh billy bigelow's daughter's life is portrayed back on earth in the second act of carousel again created by agnes de mill now agnes de mill was not did not have her works licensed with the pieces as well all the other uh, choreographers starting with jerome robbins uh enabled uh, she sort of struggled from assignment to assignment because she never had a continual income flow as the choreographers that followed her did. But Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein later on insisted that all professional productions of, of Oklahoma and Carousel uh, that she created uh, would pay her royalties for the requirement of using the ballet. And this is, of course, the second act of Carousel.
bought me my pretty dress, my father would have bought me a pretty dress, too. He was a barker on a carousel. Your father was a thief.
again, Agnes DeMille using classical ballet to make that great leap happen. Uh, after her relationship with an Allegro, uh, she does do other things, but she doesn't quite ever achieve uh, the, the Broadway musical successes that she had early on. So we're going to start on Jerome Robbins today, and uh, there's so much that he did. He was so prolific, uh, difficult beyond comprehension. Uh, he was very, very demanding of his dancers. He was not an easy guy to work with. Uh, and he was downright nasty, arrogant, uh, and thought only of himself. Now, uh, he got a complicated life. He uh, was engaged to several women, broke them off, had uh, relationships with several men, including uh, uh, Montgomery Clift, which gets him into trouble. Uh, Ed Sullivan actually uh, was an informant to the FBI who uh, goes to Jerome Robbins and says, either you go before the House on American Activities Committee and testify, it's about 1951, or I'm going to tell the world about your indecent relationship with Montgomery Clift and ruin both of your careers. Well, uh, sure enough, uh, Jerome Robbins does go before the committee. He names two names, one is Zero Mustel, uh, and the other uh, is Jack Guilford, among six other people. Those careers were all ruined for a number of years, uh, which created other challenges and issues uh, as well. But Jerome Robbins had a very prolific uh, career, starting with the fact that he grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, and he gets a, a commission at the ABT, but also does part-time uh, dance and choreography at a, at a resort in the Poconos called Cam Tamamen. Uh, it was a left-wing Jewish resort where he meets Adolf Green. Adolf Green has an interesting roommate. His roommate is Leonard Bernstein, and <laughs> the two of them develop a relationship. And Jerome Robbins is musing to Adolf Green that he's looking for someone to help him write a ballet, uh, that he wants to do something where he controls the, the piece right from the beginning, and Adolf Green introduces him to Leonard Bernstein, and they write an 11-minute ballet that is called Fancy Free. Fancy Free, now Adolf Green uh, writes for a young actress comedian whose name is Judy Tuvim. Many of you now know her or knew her as Judy Holiday, And uh, she uh, and, and Betty Comden uh, and Adolf Green like this ballet so much, it achieves lots of recognition that it becomes the musical on the town. Uh, Comden and Green write two parts for themselves, and on the left is the, is the uh, quartet, Comden and Green, Jerome Robbins, and Leonard Bernstein. Now, uh, they take their idea to George Abbott, uh, and George Abbott um, uh, uh, is smart enough to know that you don't put your own money uh, into a musical, you get somebody else's. So he sells the screen rights to On the Town to MGM, and MGM uh, can't possibly imagine Leonard Bernstein's music being popular, so they throw out most of it. But Leonard, but Jerome Robbins created some phenomenal uh, ballet sequences over the years. And this is just a quick overview of everything that he did uh, as it was seen in Jerome Robbins' Broadway in 1988. Tonight's very nominated musical began as a memory. A look back at some of the theater's most treasured moments. When their creator found the magic was still alive, he decided to weave them together into a completely new and exciting work. Jerome Robbins' Broadway is both a musical legacy and a theatrical leap forward by an artist whose greatest gift, gift is to recognize our simplest dreams and then make them fly. Just think lovely, wonderful thoughts. And up there
this was a quick overview, and we're going to get into a lot more depth uh, of these wonderful things that Jerome Robbins did. But Jerome Robbins was the first choreographer to do something that no one else had ever done, and that was to license his choreography with any professional production. Uh, if you were going to use anything that emulated Jerome Robbins' choreography or things that were written into a script, you paid for that as part of your licensing rights. And this is common practice today, but Jerome Robbins in 1950 was the first uh, of the choreographers to do that and license his works. But let's now go back to On the Town. Uh, this is the very first musical that Jerome Robbins actually uh, you know, choreographs and creates, and he was very clever about how he did this. And uh, let's take a look. Okay, a quick tour. By the way, this is Jesse Tyler Ferguson. Uh, it was Jerome Robbins' idea to actually put these two characters in a taxi. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, this was all his staging. Tour of the city. Then up to my place. No, no, to help find Gabe's girl. No, up to my place. But lady, I have It's to all settled. Where do you want to go first? Ah, the same to you! My father told me, Chip, my boy, there'll come a time when you leave home. If you should ever hit New York, be sure to see that hippodrome. The hippodrome! The hippodrome. Did I hear right? Did you say the hippodrome? Yes, you heard right. Yes, I said the hip... Hey, what did you stop for? Patrol. Well, give me a chance, kid. I haven't got 5,000 seats, but the one I got's a honey. Come up to my place. No, lady. I'd rather see the Forest Theater, huh? When I was home, I saw the place, a ladies' drama circle show. Now I am here. I want to get some tickets for Tobacco Road. Tobacco Road! Tobacco Road. Did I hear right? Did you say Tobacco Road? Yes, you dug that. Yes, I sent him back. Hey, what for did you stop? That show has closed up shop. The actors lost their feet and called it Angel's oh, Dream. I want to see Tobacco Road. Well, give me a chance, kid, and I'll show you the road to ruin. Come up to my place. No, oh, let's go to Battery Park. I dreamt of catching fish so big I couldn't carry them. They told me that they'd have my size right here in the aquarium. Aquarium! Aquarium. Hold on, Bojo. Did you say aquarium? I'm still bringing. Yes, I said that! Did you stop for one? Hey! The fish have flown away. They're in the box. It's dead. They might as well be dead. Come up to my place. Let's go to Chambers Street. They told me I could see New York and all its spreading strength and power from the city's highest spot atop the famous Woolworth Tower. Woolworth Tower! The Woolworth Tower. Baby Daddy, did you say the Woolworth Tower? I won't beat you, but I said the Woolworth Did you stop for Hey, what? That's not the highest spot. You're just Cleopatra's Needle. Let's go to my place. Let's see Watermaker Store. Let's go to my place. Let's go to Lindy's. Go to Luke Chow. Let's go to my place. Let's see Radio City and Herald Square. Let's go to my place. Rubens. Go to my place. Let's see Go to my place. Roxy. Go to my place. Oysters. My place. My place. My place. My place. My place. My Again, this choreography that Jerome Robbins uh, manufactured with the taxi cab uh, was really okay. brilliant and very far ahead of its time. Now, uh, let's look at uh, the next piece of Jerome Robbins choreography, which, um, I, you know, truly, I think we're all going to know is uh, I identified yeah. with the city.
Now, one of the other things Jerome Robbins insisted upon was multi-ethnic casting. Sonia Sato was the original ballet dancer. She was uh, 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 of Hispanic descent. And uh, he wanted brought the, the, the cast of On the Town to look like the melting pot that New York really was. Uh, and he was truly able to accomplish that. Now, uh, if you also notice, the Bernstein music has shades of what West Side Story will become. But there were 11 choreographed ballet sequences in On the Town. And uh, again, uh, this was one of the most dramatic, Gaby's Dream Ballet.
Well, we've we've covered a lot of territory today with, with the choreographers. So uh, we're going to leave Jerome Robbins to continue with next week. And we're going to see High Button Shoes. And he did Call Me Madam. And of course, The King and I, Bells Are Ringing, uh, Gypsy. A funny thing happened on the way to the form, and maybe one of the great masterpieces he did was Fiddler on the Roof. I don't know if anybody has any questions for me today, uh, but I'll, I'd be very happy to unmute and uh, take any questions. And uh, I know, Huff, you saw some of this yesterday, so I hope you didn't mind sitting through some of it again. Uh, uh, but uh, anybody have any questions for me? I have a question. Um, oh, go ahead. I'm not sure who's asking. I don't see the hand, Sharon but go ahead. Barber, I don't have a, my picture up. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm Lately, good. Love the class. Lovely. Really interesting and, and fun to watch. Um, what prepares a person like Jerome Robbins to have the skill to uh, do all the choreography? Is, was he a dancer? Or, oh, know, yeah. He was with the dancer? American Ballet. Yeah. Uh, he was with the American Ballet Theater. He studied dance from a very young age. But, you know, people like him and Gene Kelly, who started to take their dance ability and turn it to choreography, a lot of it has to do with chutzpah. Um, they decide they're better than somebody else. Fosse, the same thing. Um, uh, they, they uh, even Tommy Toon, I mean, they, they feel that they have the ability to translate what they can do to others. So they position themselves to do it. Um, Many dancers, you know, look, these are the people with the big names, but whenever I was in a show, it was always somebody who studied dance for a very long time and, and took the step to then uh, chore choreograph it. So, uh, you know, it's just making the determination, yes, I can do that. It's just like when an actor suddenly decides that he's going to direct, it's because he's decided that he believes he has the skill set uh, to do that. Sharon, that was a great question. Um, you know, what it really comes down to is somebody's willing uh, to put them behind, uh, you know, their skill uh, set to use and willing to pay them for it. Uh, you know, and again, I, I really think it's a matter of chutzpah. Great question. Anybody, have any, uh, first, I know there are a couple of you who didn't, who lost your links and got in late. I'm happy to see that you're here uh, and that you were able to get in after all. Um, uh, it does help. I'm willing to send the links out, but sometimes once I get started, I don't see the link uh, until if your request for the link, if you can't find it until I'm well in. Uh, so I apologize if I didn't see it early enough to uh, get you in uh, a little bit sooner. Uh, anybody else have anything you'd like to ask? I don't see any hands going up, but you are free to unmute if you want to ask anything. Okay, this was great. I hope everybody had a really good time today. You know what's so wonderful? We're all going to be able to go out like human beings now. <laughs> but we're going to keep these up. Don't worry. I'm keeping Friday morning alive and well, and this will be our time. Take care, everybody. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.